All right. Now, uh, we're talking about what it means to be in the um, body of Christ. Let's, um, let's continue on just a few verses. Uh, so if we go back, we left off in verse 9, I want to say, right? Um, okay, so let's go another three. Um, our soul person. Okay, would anyone like to read that for us, please? Starting in verse 10. Okay, thank you, Sophia. Really, really loud. He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Sorry, how long? Uh, well, we can pause there. Uh, that's actually some of the answers many of you gave. Uh, remember, uh, if you're talking about what does it mean to be in the body of Christ? to support others and our various vocations. And there he's listing some of them off. Maybe some of you one day might even become apostles or sorry, teachers. Uh, we'll see, we'll see what a noble vocation that might be. Um, all right, um, okay, and why? Okay, uh, for equipping the saints, right? In building up the body of Christ. So to serve, to build up the body of Christ, excellent. Let's continue going, um, verse 13. Until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ, we must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knitted together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth and building itself up in love. Ah, okay. So uh, a few key concepts there that he's talking about. The, the strange teachings, doctrines, going astray. Uh, basically, that's a code name for lies, right? What is not true. Uh, so here in the body of Christ, what he's saying is, uh, this is a repository of truth, uh, this whole body. Now, um, how is it brought together, the different members of the body? He mentions a few different members. How do they stick together? What's the glue? Does it, anyone see it there? If you go back and read, what are they, what are they, how are they brought together? What does it say? Or what is one way that we grow together in this body? There's more than one possible answer here. Andre, you got one? Well, what brings us together into the body? So, so he mentions different roles people can have in the body of Christ, but what keeps us there? What holds us together? What builds us up? Yeah? Uh, oh, good. Wait, what verse is that one? That is 15. Oh, good. Yes, and that's, that's a great one to uh, qualify. Don't just speak the truth, but in love. Because you can always speak the truth to someone and will find out to love. So, uh, yes, very good. What's another one? That's a, that's a very good answer. What's another way that the body is held together? Or how do we grow in this body? Look again. Look again. You'll see it. Yes. Okay, good. There's two answers there. Okay, what's one of them? Good. Okay, so that's one. So unity... Right? So brought together in faith in Christ. Uh, what was it the second, the second thing after? What is it? What's the next one? Yep. Okay, but there's another thing he says there. There's another the one. Yes. What was it? But what about the Son of God? Knowledge. knowledge. Right. Uh, and knowledge in the biblical sense has a, a also a sense of not just you know things, uh, like I know the data, like my address, where I live, or my postal code, but it's uh, intimacy. So this is intimacy with the Son of God, who, who we are joined to, right? Um, he says to maturity, right? To the mature man. So that is, you guys know that word in Greek. What would that word be? It's maturity. It's the same as completion. That very, very good. It's like the one word that you learned in Theology 10, <laughs> uh, right? Completion, wholeness. That's it. That's what he's talking about there. That's the word, right? To come to our final cause, right? 
Um, and what does it say? What's that final cause? Well, it's saying to belong to the fullness uh, of Christ, right? To that stature. Okay, really, really good. Um, well, there's one other thing we could say uh, that joins us together, perhaps. Or what else? Well, I guess it's, it's already been mentioned, but in verse 16, he talks about being joined together, fitted together. Uh, the purpose, of course, is not just so we can build like an amazing structure where we can be sheltered from the rain. But uh, the purpose is, what's at the very end of uh, verse 16? What's what's the building up for? What's that purpose? Want to catch it? Yeah, yeah, but why? But why? Why does it want to grow? Like, why do we want a building for? What's what's the ultimate purpose? Oh, very good. You got it. Yes. So that's the end of verse 16, right? It's building up for itself in love, just like speak truth in love and so on. All right. Now, earlier I asked you, what does it mean to be in the body of Christ? And we're, we talk, we had a, very, a, a plethora of, of fasting answers. I'm, I'm gonna, I think I was going to remember Mrs. Wright's answer. It needs to be home. Uh, uh, now, um, here I'm going to suggest, or at the end of the last one I suggested, it's also a place of thanksgiving. Uh, now, you guys got to help me out here a little bit. Sorry, there is another Greek word that you guys know. Uh, what's the Greek word for thanksgiving? If I hold my breath, will I fall? Uh, go ahead. No, yeah. Eucharist. Uh, yeah, Eucharist means I give thanks. Yeah, Eucharist, that's right. That's thanksgiving. That's right. Very good, very good. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that that's what it is. Now, a few years ago, not too many, uh, I had the privilege of teaching calm class. Uh, and part of the <laughs> outcomes in Calm is, you know, it's that uh, career life management program. Uh, a, one of the outcomes has to do with financial literacy or our financial thinking about money things, which you don't normally learn in school, but formally at least. So I'm going to ask you right now, do you have any financial goals? What are your financial goals for life? Uh, so over the course of your life, what are your financial goals? Uh, think about it real quick, yeah? University. Okay, well, the, you, yeah, so, so you have a financial goal to get money to go to university, right? Okay, good, sure. Um, what, what else, uh, what other financial goals do you guys have? To not have no money. Okay, there you go. I want to have, I don't have a place where I don't have money. Okay, okay. Um, anyone have a number? Is there a number of, of dollars that you have in mind? Oh, uh, Andre has one. Yeah, what is it? Go ahead. Or David, maybe you have it. What no, is no, it? I don't have one. I, I have okay, what is it? Mine? No, or, his? Well, sure. Either one. His, his is um, to have a million dollars. Oh, there we go. Okay, to have a one followed by six zeros. Six zeros. Wow, in the bank account. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> now, um, David and Andre have fallen right into the trap. Uh, <laughs> this is the question, and I was just waiting for the student to say, my financial goal is to have one million dollars. Uh, that, 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 okay, so last time I taught, I had a student, his name was Evan, and that's exactly what he put up his hand and says, that's my goal, I want to have one million dollars. And I wish Andre and, and, and David and, and Evan, I wish them well. Uh, and I hope it goes well for you. Remember me, please. Uh, now, uh, now, when we were in comm class, so we listened to a really unusual financial guru. Her name is uh, Christy Shen. Now, Christy Shen, very interesting. Uh, she uh, has a lot to say about wealth and poverty. She now lives, well, depending on the time you're in Canada. But she grew up in China uh, during the wake of the Cultural Revolution and, and experienced what we would call absolute poverty. Now, now much has changed since then. Uh, maybe Mr. Foss, you could probably tell us a little bit. Uh, in, in China now, I'm just, the Cultural Revolution is a generation or so ago. Um, is there is it now more pro, uh, land of prosperity or, or what? How would you describe it? Like how, like how do people still talk about it or? Um... Well, just the day-to-day -day life. Um, is that, is, is it, it's long in the past. Uh, it depends where you are. There's some people who still live pretty close to absolute poverty, uh, but you come into the city and it's uh, people are well past $1 million. <laughs> how much they're throwing around with each other. So. Okay. So it really depends, yeah. Okay, so um, what happened with, with Christy? She emigrated to Canada, uh, 
went into um, software engineering, I believe it was. But basically by the time her and her husband got to the age of 31, she was able to say she had one million dollars in her bank account. Um, and guess what she did? This is a very unusual move. She retired. She, that's right, she quit her job. And people are like, are you crazy? Uh, what are you thinking? I mean, if you reach that success at age 31, why don't you just work a, another 10 years or, and you can have $2 million uh, in, in, the, in your bank account or, or, or whatever. Um, so uh, this is her answer. So then the, it, it, she says, it wouldn't bring about more happiness. So it wouldn't bring about more happiness. And she says, it's actually her childhood. Her childhood taught her that. Uh, because she had to learn how to get by on very, very little. Uh, and, and now, that's exactly what she plans to do. Uh, continue living off very, very little and just using the interest of her savings. Now, psychologists have, uh, in, their, in their research and study, the, the state of mind that um, if we're in a state where we always want more, so more dollars or whatever the case may be, more and more and more. This is a fast track to what? Can you guess? Oh, you got it, John. Exactly it. That's exactly what they say. It's the fast track to unhappiness. Uh, so now the question is, um, why? <laughs> right? So why, why is that? Well, um, here, let's just give you an example. Let's just say, for the sake, for the sake of argument, you make a lot of money, okay? So let's say you finish Chesterton. First year out of high school, you make $963,000 in one year. Would you be happy at that point? Yes. So you're making $963,000. You didn't become a teacher. And you did not become a teacher, no. Um, but would you be happy at that point? Well, it depends what kind of job you have. If you are drafted into the NHL, you would actually be making minimum wage. Okay, so we looked at it. That's actually the minimum wage, $963,000 a year, is minimum wage for an NHL player. Uh, so, so you might not actually be that happy because you look around and you're like, wow, I'm the least well paid uh, in this entire uh, dressing room. Uh, now, okay, let's just say you don't make the NHL. But you get a job that's, you make half as much, okay? So you're making 450K a year. Uh, they found that people who make 450K a year can still be very unhappy with their financial situation if what? If they live in a neighborhood where the average salary is double. So let's say the average salary is a million dollars. You're making less than half of everyone else. They've Psychologist tells those people on the bottom of that neighborhood usually are going to be unhappy. Unhappy. Uh, so, very interesting. Now, why? Why do you think they're unhappy? Or why do you think that minimum wage NHL player might be unhappy as well? Okay, yeah, go for it. Because in our modern society, money is not often something that we need to use to survive, to buy clothes and pay taxes to survive. We also use it as a social status. So if we have more money than other people, we feel better, even if what we make is not the average wage. Uh, very good. So we have more than enough we need for food and shelter and so on, uh, but we're going to use those dollars as a means to compare ourselves to the next person kind of thing, right? So the short answer is this. Uh, if we are constantly comparing ourselves to the next person, uh, the Joneses down the road and whatever uh, uh, they, they can afford and I can't, then yes, that is a fast track to uh, on, on happiness. Now, um, let's connect this into being members of the body of, of Christ. Uh, we were told, was Jesus rich or was he poor? This, this is an interesting question. He was a teacher. Uh, he was a teacher. <laughs> that is a good answer. Well, okay. Then yes, uh, he's a, a, a rabuni or a teacher. Good. So, uh, Kathleen, was he rich or poor? Okay. 
Olivia, what would you say? Did you use rich or poor? Okay, okay. Noah, what would you say? I'm saying he's like medium average. Oh, he's going to fake the, the, the middle, the middle uh, route here. Okay, sure, sure. He's, he's middle of the road. I would say he was the most degraded because Nazareth people were seen as like the worst. And he also didn't have any money. He just would walk around preaching. So to the normal people, he was seen as Oh, so eventually he, he finished his career and then he became an itinerant uh, preacher. Yes, yes, good. So that part would probably be more poverty. Okay, so there's different ways you can answer it. Um, in Corinthians, we're told that he was actually rich. Um, and out of his richnesses, he decided to become poor. Now, Paul there is referring to his incarnation, right? So the riches, he decided to arm himself and to become uh, uh, poor. Uh, so uh, here, what is the solution, we might uh, ask you, um, for for not falling into this trap of the minimum wage NHL player uh, or the, the very comparatively well-to-do person but living in a, in a, uh, a finer, a constant comparison also. What's the solution here? All right, talk to the person beside you, see what you come up with, and I want to know what your solution is. What answers did you get? I want to hear some uh, solutions. Yes. Yeah, no, go for it. Did you remember? You would be happy. I forget the, yeah, <laughs> That's a good answer. There's, 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 there's no unhappiness here. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. But learning, learning to realize that comparing yourself to others will make you feel like you're inadequate, and that if you feel inadequate, you're going to feel resentful and angry at yourself and towards others. So you must learn that you can only compare yourself to yourself <laughs> and what you can achieve. Okay, so so reframing <laughs> or recalibrating how you look at uh, the world and what metric you're using to compare to others. That's one really good answer. Uh, or, or, uh, what's another one? What's another one? There's another one. Uh, yeah, okay, Mr. Foss has got one. Well, uh, you remember from Dante, he says okay. that uh, the sin of envy, the way you hear that is with the virtue of love. So if you love others, you're going to be happy that they have more money. Yeah. Right. You're not going to be like resentful and envious and want more, but you'll be like, God, thank you for blessing the people around me so much. So you can will the highest good of the other. So one solution might be love. Then you're not thinking about yourself and how much you make. Yes, yes. So, okay. Wow, I'm so, I'm so happy. I, I, I love it that there, there's so much greater status than me. Uh, <laughs> and that's good for them. That, that, that'd be difficult, but that'd be a true call of love. That'd be a true act of charity. Uh, to 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 bless that other person uh, in their prosperity, as opposed to like wishing them ill or something, right? Yeah, yeah. So that'd be a real act of love. Yeah, good, good. Do you have one? Do not have like that be your focus. Not have it be a focus. Okay. To use every bit of money you can to show how much money you have. Sure. So so wealth and possessions are not going to be your focus. Good. Now, how do you not make it your focus? Uh, is it what 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 strategy? Yes. Okay, good. I'm placing your focus on Christ. Okay, um, good, good. Uh, that's a good answer. That's that's the that's the right answer. Uh, and and um, what's one good way we can do that? So what would you say? How how would you do that? How would you place your focus on Christ? What's one way you can get into that way of looking at life? I think it's devoting your life. You need to be able to give up things and to realize. Giving it up, okay. Embracing Christ, good, good. Okay, yeah. Let's just hand it. Say not idolizing the wealth, making Christ the center of your life. Because if wealth is the center of your life, yep. then of course you're gonna be happy. Okay, so not idolizing. And I guess my question, though, Andre, to follow up would be, what's the easy way to make Christ constantly at the center? Um, what's what's one easy way to remember that? Yeah. Anything that's replacing him. Make sure you're devoting that. Okay, so so channel your money, your time to him. Yeah, always bring it back. Is this for him? Yeah. Okay, that's good. Here's here's another suggestion. Does anyone have any other ones? I was just yeah, go for it. Yeah. That another thing that can help you from getting back to the envy of wanting more is to focus not on the success and the goal, but you trying. Christ cares about you trying to devote your time to him. Of you just trying to succeed, and he doesn't care about all the outcomes, but just the amount. Yes. Okay. So in that effort, and, and so again, 
that effort and just that step by step, trying to devote yourself. My question here is, but what makes that step a little bit easier? Here, here's a suggestion. Um, okay, I'll, just give, I'll just give you a quick answer. Uh, <laughs> one is, okay, earlier we said the body of Christ is not a place of darkness. We also suggested it's a place of thanksgiving. Oh, you were going to say that? You were about to say that, right? No, okay. Uh, a place of thanksgiving, that's right. Um, because the body of Christ is, is, is what? Well, it reminds us of the Eucharist, right? The body of Christ. Um, and Jesus, what does he do? He gives thanks to his Father, right? It's, it's a place of thanksgiving. And that act of constantly giving thanksgiving for all that we have, because all of this is a gift. We don't have to be here. Um, but God willed us to be here. It's all a gift. So that spirit of thanksgiving is a way of reframing how we look at everything around us and drawing it back. So yes, step by step, day in, day out, we can continue to give ourselves back to God because all of this is a spirit of, of, of thanksgiving. Now, how are we doing for time? Uh, we're at 1.25. Okay, so uh, this is just another minute or two and we'll wrap up. Quickly talk to the person beside you and tell us what is it that you are thankful for. Uh, we just had Thanksgiving, so you should be on the top of your mind. Uh, this should be quick, easy answers. 